Okay, I can hear you just fine, Maria, Commissioner Berger. Thank you, Mary Lou. All righty, um, I would like to call, and I pardon, pardon me, but I have to read. I would like to call to order the May 21st, 2020 TPA governing board meeting pursuant to the governor's executive order number 20-69 and TPA emergency order number 2020-02. The Palm Beach TPA is conducting this meeting virtually using the Zoom webinar platform. The TPA selected this virtual platform because it does not require the public to purchase or download any additional software or equipment to attend this meeting. Aside from the Zoom webinar platform that the participants will, be, will use to, add, uh, to attend remotely, the public will have no discernible difference in their ability to watch the meeting from that of someone physically attending the meeting. Instruction to join the virtual meeting as well as contact information for a TPA staff member to assist you are provided in the published meeting agenda. Please note that the members of the governing board will be appearing at today's meeting remotely, either via webcam or telephone. Additionally, scheduled presenters and the executive director will also be appearing via webcam or telephone. Board members, please note that your microphones are initially set on mute. When you wish to be recognized, please use the raised hand function within the Zoom platform and then unmute your microphones when you are recognized. Before we begin, I will summarize our public comment procedure for this virtual meeting. Written documents, comments, and questions can be submitted online at the website provided in the agenda. Verbal comments can also be made live through the Zoom webinar platform. When you wish to be recognized, please use the raised hand function within the Zoom platform and then wait to be recognized by the chair and unmuted by the meeting host. Uh, Margie, if somebody raises their hand and I haven't noticed, would you please let me know? Of course. Thank you. Okay, so at this time, I would ask Mayor Steve Wilson to open our meeting in prayer and then to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, let us pray. Oh, Sorry. Heavenly Father, we come to you once again with bowed heads and humble hearts, thanking you for your grace and your mercy. Realizing again, Father, that through your grace and your mercy, you've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. And with that, we say thank you. Thank you, Father, for covering our country and keeping us at world peace while we overcome this obstacle, knowing that through your grace, this too should pass. Thank you for caring for those who are in need. Open our eyes to the material and spiritual needs of those near and afar. And Father, help us to know how to respond to those who may be at need. Thank you also, Father, for our world food supply, our healthcare workers, our law enforcement officers, teachers and administrators, our government officials, and all those you have allowed to be in power and have dominion over the goodwill of mankind. You know our hearts and our desires, Father. Continue to create in us a clean heart and a willingness to forgive and, and love each other. And finally, Father, we ask a special blessing upon the chairperson of this meeting and all of us whom you have allowed to be assembled here today, realizing that we're no strangers to each other, but perhaps friends we have not yet met. We give you all the praises and the glory. Amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. A Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic, Republic for which, which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and, and justice, justice for all. all. Thank you all. Okay. Marty, could you call the roll, please? Yes, and I will unmute all to make it a little bit easier for everybody. If you're calling in on your phone and you've muted on there, you will need to unmute yourself. Um, Joseph Anderson. Present. Mary Lou Berger. Here. Joni Brinkman. Here. Joel Flores. Present. Stephen Grant. Jim Koretsky. Here. Shirley Lanier. Maria Marino. Here. Melissa McKinley. 
Michael Napoleon. Here. Corey Neary. Here. Joseph Paduzzi. Here. Shelly Petrolia. Fred Pinto. Here. Scott Singer. Here. Andy Thompson. Thankful to be here. Pam Triolo. Oh, Mayor, you are muted. I'm going to unmute you. Oh, you'll have to unmute it on your end, Mayor. Here. Thank you. Uh, Hal Balashe. Here. Robert Weinroth. Here. Greg Weiss. Steve Wilson. Here. We have a quorum, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. May I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So Weinroth move. moves the agenda. And a second? Second. second. I have a, a motion by Weinroth and a second by Valache. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. And now may I have a motion to approve the minutes from April 16th, 2020? So moved. I have no idea who said who so moved. So I, I believe I had Anderson and Berger. Okay, perfect. Correct. So I have a motion by Anderson and a second by Berger. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. Okay. Comments from the chair and member comments. I think we have quite a long agenda. Does anybody have anything in, that they can't wait to talk about? Good. Okay. So, but I'm going to read what it says here. If any board member has a comment for the board, please utilize the raise hand function of the Zoom platform to ask to be recognized and then remember to unmute your microphone once they are recognized. Anybody have a comment? I don't see anybody's hand up. Okay. Executive Director. Oh, Madam Chair, I do have a hand raise. You I'm do? Sorry. From whom? Um, I have a 561-301-2443. Madam Chair, this is Douglas Lawson, Councilmember of Vera Beach. Just wanted uh, the record reflect that I am in attendance. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. With that, I'll go to Nick for the Executive Director's Report. Oh, Nick, you are muted. You'll need to unmute yourself. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the TPA Board, it's a pleasure to see you virtually this morning. And I'm going to briefly cover just uh, four quick items. First, we, we've had a lot of inquiries about State Road 80 street lighting, and I wanted to give you an update on the State Road 80 street lighting in western Palm Beach County. Uh, DOT is installing street lighting at three significant intersections along the State Road 80 corridor. They're doing it at the west end at Main Street, State Road 15, in the middle at Sugar House Road, which is recently renamed George Wedgworth Way, and then also street lighting to be installed at Hatton Highway, that intersection. Uh, construction should be complete for those three locations by March of 2021, and they are in the middle of their lighting feasibility study for the remainder of the corridor. That study began in December, and they should be ready to report to us on the outcome of that study in July, maybe August, if not September at our TPA board meeting. Also wanted to mention that DOT recently decided to repeal their 2019 approval of a lane elimination project for South Dixie Highway. That's the uh, TPA's local initiative priority 16-2. That means that we added it to our priority list in 2016 and it was our number two local initiatives project that year. It was scheduled to be funded for construction, $7 million or so for construction in fiscal 21. DOT said they don't think it's a good idea to go from four lanes to three lanes, but they have committed to working with the city to evaluate potential alternatives for that project. And we'll be glad to report back to you as soon as we have any additional information. Uh, kind of an interesting one in the lower traffic volumes that we're seeing in the uh, COVID-19 pandemic timeframe, DOT and Palm Beach County are gonna be testing the installation of a temporary roundabout at the intersection of Okeechobee Boulevard and Jog Road. It's a huge intersection that they will be converting from a signalized intersection to a one lane roundabout. Only on Saturday morning, they're gonna set it up for a couple of hours, uh, Saturday, May 30th. They're gonna operate as a roundabout for about two hours, eight to 10 a.m. and then they're gonna spend the next two hours taking it back down. If any of you wanna come out on a Saturday morning and see what uh, a roundabout looks like at a huge signalized intersection, this would be your opportunity. Point of this is to see if they can use this concept 
during a uh, hurricane response time frame when we're without power at some of our large intersections, instead of using a four-way stop sign, they would be potentially installing these kinds of temporary roundabouts to allow traffic to keep moving as we go through the response and recovery time after a storm. And then last item I wanna mention is we are conducting an online survey right now asking residents how your travel behaviors have changed during this period of COVID-19 restrictions, and then whether you think those changes will be permanent or whether you'll re resume back to traditional behaviors. Uh, so look forward to sharing some results from that with you. And then we would also ask if you haven't had an opportunity, you can take that survey at the website link shown right there on the director's report, uh, palmbeachtpa.org slash travel hyphen survey. And if you would help us share that survey with uh, members in your community, we'd love to hear more about how people are moving right now during this, um, during this time frame, and then whether the population thinks that those kinds of changes will persist when uh, we're allowed to resume normal activities. And Madam Chair, that wraps up my report for this morning. Well, thank you very much. Um, are there any public comments? We have not received any public comments, Madam Chair. Any board members with comments or questions? I do have that uh, Michael Napoleon and Mayor Wilson have their hands raised. Okay, uh, Michael, why don't you go first? Good morning. I just wanted to know how long the survey is going to be live and what, what it, the end date is. So we had intended for it to run through the end of May, uh, but based on the responses, we may extend it a few, a couple more weeks into the middle of June. Thanks. But we'd like to get some information back to, to the TPA board at the June meeting, just kind of preliminary feedback on how people are feeling, really, because it's not a scientific survey. It's not a statistically significant sample size. This is just a social media outreach to get a, a pulse of the community. Thank you. Steve. Hi, thank you, Madam Chair, okay. to Nick. Uh, it, 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 thank to this board. I, I guess it's a great start with State Road 80. Um, I guess my question to Nick is, on, on those intersections, were there a study done on that to get that approval? And, and again, we're most appreciative of getting that done. It's a great start for us, but I'm wondering was there a study on that to get the intersection done? It's a, it's a good question. And I think my answer, as I understand it, is no. There was not a study done to justify installation of the streetlights at those intersections because there's a premise behind that that cars entering from side streets in a dark environment inherently present a risk. Whereas if you're talking about lighting the entirety of the corridor, you're, you're evaluating the potential for a different kind of traffic behavior to create risk for motorists. And you wanna determine whether there's been a pattern of that kind of behavior in the middle of the roadway in between the signalized intersections and the side street um, access points. And that, that study is necessary for the middle portion of the road to determine whether that larger capital investment is appropriate from a DOT perspective. And my final comment, Madam Chair, is that, and, and thank you, Nick, um, regardless whether it's Dark Street or the entire um, State Road 80, there's a need for it, and I don't have to continue um, letting you guys know that. You all have been supportive, but it just seemed to me that um, if there's a need for it for the intersection, look like there's a need for the entire State Road 80, and I'm hoping that um, that study will um, have the same result. Thank you. Thank you. Any other Margie, anybody, anybody else have their hand up? I don't see any other members with their hand okay, up. Okay, then. We'll um, move on to... Uh, the chair, I'm sorry, really quick before we move on. I just want to note for the record that we do have Commissioner McKinley with us, as well as Mayor Petrolia. She joined by phone, and uh, Commissioner McKinley just joined virtually. Thank you very much. All righty, so we are on to our consent agenda. Would any board member like to remove an item from the consent agenda? Hearing none, I need a motion to approve, please. A motion by Mayor Flores. Okay, and a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Berger. Thank you very much. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you all. Uh, general public comments. Staff, do we have any comment cards? No, Madam Chair, we haven't received any general public comments. All right, we are going to move on to our action items then. So uh, action item number one is the motion to create a strategic plan evaluation committee. So the TPA strategic plan
plan operates on a state fiscal year consistent with our agency budget, which starts July 1st and ends June 30th. The TPA adopted the fiscal year 20 strategic plan in July of 2019. Each year since 2017, we have created a committee to both evaluate our performance over the past year and focus our objectives for the coming year. I am asking for three TPA board members to serve on a committee with myself and Mayor Pinto to do a deeper dive into how we did this how we did this year and what we should focus on in the coming year. Our intention is to meet only once in June and then to make recommendations to the full board in July. So staff, do I have any public comments on this? No, Madam Chair. All right, then I need a motion to create a strategic plan evaluation committee with five members and then I will open the floor to volunteers. So may I have a motion please? So moved by Mayor Shelley Petrolia. Okay. Stag by Mayor Flores. Wonderful. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so uh, let's see. We need, I'm sorry, Margie, we're, we're taking our volunteers now, correct? Correct, Nick? Madam Chair. All right, so who would like to volunteer? I need at least three. Madam Chair. A volunteer. Weinroth. Mayor Flores. I have Weinroth. <laughs> okay, right, let's hold not on. get too unwieldy here. <laughs> what, I have Weinroth, Valache, Flores, and Singer. Berger. I had Singer and Andy Thompson. All right, we're kind of large. You all, we're going to have to pick one day in, in June in order to get this done. If you can be on the meeting, we will. If you can't, you won't. It's that simple because we now have what, eight people? Margie, yes, would, you would you uh, repeat the names, please? Of course. I have uh, Marino, Pinto, Weinroth, Balache, Flores, Berger, Singer, and Thompson. All right. Commissioner Berger, Commissioner Berger will step aside. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, one more time slowly. I'm writing names down. Of course. Maria Marino, Fred yep. Pinto, Robert Weinroth. Hal Valache, Joel Flores, Scott Singer, Andy Thompson. Perfect. Okay. Um, Margie, I think you're next, right? Um, the, motion, yes. the motion on the um, floor is. Yes. Oh. Madam Chair, you, you actually conducted the vote immediately after asking for the motion, but prior to having discussion about the volunteers. And so the, I guess what we would be voting on now is an amended motion to create the committee with the seven members that were identified in the volunteering process. So you we would need to solicit a motion for the seven members, and then we okay. could vote on that. Mayor Shelley Petroli amends the motion. Thank you. Joseph Anderson seconds. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are going to now make a vote on Marino, Pinto, Weinroth, Thompson, Valachay, Flores, and Singer. Correct. And now is this a roll call or is it we can all just do, I'm trying to read the notes here. We had this listed as a roll call vote, Madam Chair. Okay, are we unmuted then so everybody can vote? We are unmuting all right now. Perfect. All righty, Marge, Margie, please go ahead. Okay, Joseph Anderson. It's a yes if you're um, approving the amendment. Um, I, I think you need to unmute on your end. Oh, yes, there yes. You Thank you. Um, Mary Lou Berger. Yes. Joni Brinkman. Yes. Joel Flores. Yes. Stephen Grant. Jim Koretsky. Yes. Shirley Lanier. Maria Marino. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. For Shirley Lanier, it's Douglas Lawson. My apologies. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, Melissa McKinley. Yes. Michael Napleon. Yes. Corey Nearing. Yes. Joseph Paduzzi. Yes. Shelley Petrolia. Yes. Fred Pinto. Yes. Scott Singer. Yes. Andy Thompson. Yes. P 
Pam Chirolo? Yes. Hal Valache? Yes. Robert Weinroth? Yes. Greg Weiss? Steve Wilson? Yes. It passes unanimously, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. All right, we will move on to action item B. Motion to adopt a resolution amending the fiscal year 1920 United Unified Planning Work Program. Okay, um, may I please invite Matthew Coma, our TPA Chief Financial Officer, to present this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Again, I'm Matthew Kama, the CFO here at the TPA. And I bring before you today a, both an amendment to fiscal, year to fiscal year 20 of the 19 and 20 UPWP and the draft fiscal year 21-22 UPWP for your approval. As a reminder, the UPWP constitutes our two-year business plan and our budget. We operate on a state fiscal year between July 1st and June 30th. And with that UPWP, it serves as our application for federal grant funding as well. We include a list of activities that we're going to perform and answer key questions, such as what we will produce, who will produce those efforts, when we will complete it, and how much it's actually going to cost us. In fiscal year 20 of the current 1920 UPWP, we are deobligating 500,000 in PL funds. Those funds will roll to fiscal year 21. We are removing 600,000 in FHWA SU funds, and those funds will be uh, made available to TPA priority projects in fiscal year 2021. And we are adding 211,000 in FTA funding from available uh, grant funds. Lastly, we're aligning our the budgets for our available funding and planned expenses through the end of fiscal year 20. For the, UP, the fiscal year 21-22 UPWP, we have 4.5 million in available funding for fiscal year 21 and 3.8 million in funding available in 22. That breaks down 93% federal, 3.6 from the state, and 3.4 from, from local funding. We divide our expenditures into two, two groups or classes. One's grant funded and the other is locally funded expenditures. And then they're further subdivided into four categories. For our grant funded expenditures, we have personnel, travel, consultants, and direct expenses. And then for our locally funded expenditures, we have our advocacy, public engagement, staff performance, and then the, the balance goes to our, our TPA reserve fund. Where we are in this process for adopting the new UPWP for 21 and 22 is today we bring it for your approval. After that, it will be provided to FDOT and they will in turn provide it to FHWA and FTA and FHWA and FTA for final approval. That concludes my presentation. Uh, I'm available for any, any questions. Thank you. Are there any public comments? I have none, Madam Chair. Okay. I need a motion to adopt a resolution amending the fiscal year 1920 UPWP and approving the fiscal year 2122 UPWP. And then I will open the floor to discuss. Weinroth makes a motion to adopt. May I have a second, please? Mayor Petroli, second. I'm sorry? I Mayor, Mayor Petroli, 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 a second. Okay, thank you. All those in favor? Oh, Madam Chair, for that, yeah. um, you can just take the motion and then open it up. Oh, you discussion. have to do, that's right, you have to do a roll call. Okay. Um, so you can open it up for discussion. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, I guess we're going to do a roll call vote for this also? Yes, we will. 
All right, thank you. And this time I'm gonna call the names in the opposite order. Okay. Because um, <laughs> I know that some prefer to change it up, so. Uh, Steve Wilson. Greg Weiss. Robert Weinroth. Yes. Hal Valachay. Um, hang on one second. Um, here, yes. Pam Triolo. Yes. Andy Thompson. Yes. Scott Singer. Yes. Fred Pinto. Yes. Shelly Petrolia. Yes. Joseph Paduzzi. Yes. Corey Neary. Yes. Michael Napoleon. Yes. Melissa McKinley. Yes. Maria Marino. Yes. Douglas Lawson. Yes. Jim Koretsky. Yes. Stephen Grant. Joel Flores. Yes. Joni Brinkman. Yes. Mary Lou Berger. Um, I just want to make sure. Um, Commissioner, you may be muted on your actual cell phone. I'm showing that you're unmuted here. Yes. And Joseph Anderson. Yes. It passes unanimously, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. All righty. We are going to move now to action item C, motion to adopt a resolution prohibiting legal briefings in certain litigations. And I would like to invite Paul Googleman, our TPA general counsel to present this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before we get started, I would like to ask uh, Commissioners Nearing and Peducci, uh, who I want to thank for a very, a very uh, generous and kind conversation individually. I'd like to ask them uh, officially for the record if they uh, are desirous of recusing themselves from private legal briefings and any uh, executive session meetings. Hi, this is Joe Peduzzi. Um, yes, I am in agreement to recuse myself from any private legal briefings. Um, I, that would also, um, I'm also in agreement with regard to any shade meetings, although I would question the, the necessity of shade meetings, um, given the fact that you have the opportunity to privately legally brief uh, the members. So that's that's really my position. I just think that Excluding members from from meetings of the board is a slippery slope, um, and uh, it's something I think that the TPA should avoid if at all possible. I mean, who do you decide to exclude? Is it just representatives from the city, uh, or is it also to include those that are sympathetic to our cause or those that voted with us? Um, I just think that it, it sets a bad precedent. But I wouldn't be in agreement, though, in recusing myself from um, private legal briefings, and, and I'm in agreement with um, not attending any shade or litigation meetings. Thank you, Joe. Hi, good morning. Uh, this is uh, Coordinating Commissioner West Palm Beach. Uh, I agree with the uh, sentiments of my colleague, uh, Commissioner Peduzzi, um, in terms of recusing myself from private meetings or uh, executive sessions. Uh, I will state for the record, this has always been about and will continue to be about the process uh, for me. I think uh, the pro process is more important than the outcome. And I have uh, really from the genesis of this issue have really talked about the process and making sure that we are above board uh, when it comes to that. So um, as I am not a hypocrite, <laughs> I can't um, talk about that as a fundamental mechanism and then not uh, display that uh, in terms of what is just clearly a process issue and it makes no sense for me to be a part of uh, either uh, executive sessions related to this uh, litigation or a private briefing. So I will absolutely uh, recuse myself. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. so Paul. 
take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, I want I, I want to thank uh, Commissioners uh, Nearing and Peducci. Uh They have obviously shown the type of collegiality uh, that's typical of the Palm Beach TPA, and I, I, I'm personally very appreciative of it. Uh, as you can see, we've got somewhat of a naughty situation. Uh, based on the recusal, there may or may not in the board's uh, decision-making be a need for this resolution, but essentially what the resolution does is it would prohibit anybody that is uh, actually involved in the litigation uh, regarding the LRTP amendment in, who, whose uh, uh, jurisdiction is taking a position adverse uh, to, the, uh, to the position of the TPA, which in this particular case at the current time is only the city of West Palm Beach. It would only prohibit uh, individual members from that jurisdiction from participating in private legal briefings. I don't believe that we have the authority under state law to prohibit them from shade meetings, but they've obviously agreed to voluntarily refuse themselves. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Madam Chair, this is Weinroth. I don't know how to put my hand up, so I'll have to be a little bit. Uh, okay, out. Bob, go ahead. Um, I had a conversation with Nick offline on this, so it's not going to be a surprise. But I have some real reservations about this process and certainly understand where we find ourselves in a predicament with one of our members adverse to our position as a body and seeking to overturn that position through the courts. But I think that we all need to step back here and realize any one of us could be in the same position. And I think we're opening up a real can of worms here if we pass this and formally uh, exclude any member or any member city or uh, entity from any meeting of this body or any private briefings. I think that we have a problem that we, you know, we would deal with with sunshine in many ways that we would love to have conversations offline, but we just can't. And I have some serious problems with where this could land us later. And as I said, any one of us on this body could find us in the same situation as the city of Bo as the city of West Palm Beach, and uh, I am very very uncomfortable taking this step. Uh, to voluntarily recuse themselves, I think, is uh, certainly a very uh, helpful, but to formally uh, require that they either not be participating in uh, in these offline meetings. Uh, privately or in shade meetings, I, I have very, I have a real difficulty supporting. Thank you, All Chair. Right. Uh, before we go on, the normal is to take the motion and the second and then have the discussion. So may I have a motion and a second, please? Move to approve, Napoleon. Thank you, and a second? Thompson seconds. Thank you very much. Okay, now discussion. Anyone else like to, anybody else have their hand up, Mars? I don't have any icons that show hands are raised. And for the record, Madam Chair, we don't have any public comments on this item. I do oh. have a uh, Commissioner Anderson just raised his hand, actually. Sure. Go ahead, Joe. Hi. Um, you know, um, wanted to ask, um, and I know I spoke briefly with uh, Ms. Buren. Does this, because I know when the initial vote was taken, um, there just wasn't uh, those you know, two commissioners that were opposed. Does this extend to any board member that is opposed um, to this um, resolution? Or actually- let me, let me jump in and then Paul, you can jump in. Is my understanding that, you know, we do have representatives from West Palm Beach that sit on several of our other committees. So what we are doing is this would be excluding anyone from the city of West Palm Beach that has a representation on a TPA committee. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Are there any other comments? Melissa, your box just went on. Would you like to say something? <laughs> uh, I wasn't planning on it, but since you've called on me, 
Um, I, you know, I'm reading the resolution and I'm reading section two and what it says is not furnish private briefings related to litigation strategy or matters related to the lawsuit. So why would that affect their ability to serve on some of the subcommittees? I'm, I'm not following you. Ms. Um, no, not to serve on a subcommittee, but be part of the discussion as a member of a subcommittee who is a representative of West Palm Beach. And a subcommittee related to this litigation? Correct. Okay, well, I'm for this motion because, you know, you can't have it both ways. You can't be the one suing the organization and then, you know, uh, being part of the litigation strategy for your opposing party. And so I thank, um, I thank our legal counsel for putting this very thoughtful resolution together and I will be supporting it. Thank you. All righty, do I have any more comments? Madam Chair, I do have a public comment and I also have a member comment. Okay, so public comment first, please. Um, Betty, argue I am going to allow you to talk and you will need to, um, I'm sorry, you'll need to unmute your cell phone if that's what you're calling in on. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I, I support this resolution and I appreciate that uh, the representatives have agreed to um, uh, recuse themselves from those shade sessions. It only makes sense to me. Uh, so thank you for doing that. Thank you, Betty. And who else had their hand up? I have uh, Vice Mayor Napoleon. Go right ahead. Thank you. I was literally going to say the same sentence that Ms. Argue just said. I appreciate Commissioners Peduzzi and Nearing recusing themselves, and I think this is the right approach because I think uh, when you are taking an adversarial position to the board you sit on, you can't be part of the discussions on how we resolve that litigation. And as long as this is limited to litigation and lawsuit only, I think this is uh, proper and appropriate. All righty. Madam Chair, I have Commissioner Peduzzi with his hand raised. Thank you. Go ahead, Joe. Thank you. Just briefly, um, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Weinroth for his comments. Um, you know, I think the issue is essentially moot or could be considered moot because of the fact that both Commissioners Nearing and I um, have agreed to voluntarily recuse ourselves from both types of meetings. I just, uh, I concur with Commissioner Weinroth that, that uh, you know, I think it sets a bad precedent though, voting to exclude members um, we've already voluntarily and publicly said that we will uh, recuse ourselves and I'm not interested in hearing any legal strategies from the TPA that would put me in a position of conflict with the city. Um, so I, I really don't think that, that a formal vote on it is necessary. Thank you, Jill. Corey, I see your hand up. Thank you. Sorry. I, I, I too don't understand or, or uh, need to figure out the hand raise uh, issue. But um, yeah, I, I really want to echo again those sentiments. I think it's I think it's really important that um, we have you know gone on the record that we are planning and will recuse ourselves. I mean, again, um, the, the issue here I'll go back to process is not tomorrow, but five years from now, ten years from now, this board um, at some point I realize that perhaps this is the first time this is an anomaly and somewhat setting precedent. But at some point, this will happen again uh, to some degree. And uh, again, I think at that point, it should be up to uh, the uh, commissioner to, to voluntarily uh, you know, take uh, that stance as opposed to a uh, board voting um, uh, in this way. So I, I just, um, I'm not saying anything new, but I, I do believe that it's a, a slippery slope and it, and it sets a, a an interesting precedent that uh, this board will have to deal with for, for years to come. So just want to uh, be overstated in that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone Chair, else, Margie? I do have um, Jim Kretzky, Melissa McKinley, and then our legal counsel, Paul. Thank you. Jim? Um, I appreciate um, the representatives uh, recusing themselves and uh, also the uh, recommendation before us, I feel like we're really threading a needle um, and I, I'm supportive, unless I hear something otherwise, I'm supportive of it as presented. But I want to point out that while the two regular members have recused themselves, what I think in acting upon this is if in fact the alternates 
come forth and want to ask, then they're not addressed. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I do feel the need to um, support this very difficult uh, policy decision um, on that on that on those merits. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah, I want to thank Councilman Koretsky because um, I had the same comments. While I certainly appreciate Commissioner Peduzzi and Commissioner Nearing's uh, willingness to recuse themselves, uh, one of them uh, was not present for the vote. It was actually their alternate, Commissioner Lambert, who cast the vote at this meeting in question in December. Um, and so it, you know, it's not enough for the two of them to recuse and something could happen between uh, now and the, the final resolution of this litigation. There are elections, um, there are life events, and I believe that having this in pa on paper and in writing uh, would make it applicable to any person from the city of West Palm Beach who ends up sitting on this TPA and has to make these decisions. So again, um, I continue to support the resolution, thanks. Thank you. Paul, you're next. Did, did any of the alternates also uh, agree to recuse themselves? Uh, we actually did not speak with them. Okay. Did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to make, make it very clear just for the record that uh, with all this discussion of recusal, uh, the West Palm Beach members would not be recused and would not be barred from participating in any uh, public TPA governing board decision regarding uh, this litigation or from voting on any issues regarding this litigation. So we wanna be real clear about that. And the last point that I will make to you is that one of the reasons for this is that the TPA governing board is my client and I need direction from my client uh, as to how I'm, I'm to, to react and to deal with some of these issues. And unfortunately, they're kind of naughty from a bar ethical standpoint. Thank you. Any, uh, because I don't I'm, see any other hands I raised. Do, I'm sorry, uh, Chair. Uh, I do have Mayor Triolo has her hand raised. Pam, go right ahead. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was just wondering, is there any way to create something in our TPA bylaws that would like allow, that would basically say that a member of the TPA, should they be involved with litigation of the TPA, would need to, um, recuse themselves from these types of meetings should a lawsuit arise? Paul? Well, one of the things on that is, is obviously uh, the decision to recuse in this case on Commissioners Nearing and Peduzzi's part has been, has been voluntary for, for which I'm personally appreciative. Um, and, I, and I think that's kind of the way that we've approached, we've tried to approach this. And this resolution really, uh, uh, is nothing more than to implement their decision. Okay, thank you. Know. Pam? Did you, know, you have I, anything add, to add, Pam? You know, I just didn't know if that was could be some sort of policy thing from the, any city in the future or any members of it, so that it would, you know, allow for these types of legal briefings or strategy sessions, you know, would just automatically be a moot point. But, okay, I understand. Thank you. Margie, any other questions? Any other hands up? I don't see any other hands raised, Madam. All righty, then let's call the question. Um, and it'll be roll call, correct? Correct. All right. Are you starting in the middle this time? <laughs> no, I'm starting from the top again. Okay, I'm going to unmute all. All right, so Joseph Anderson? Yes. Mary Lou Berger? Yes. But we haven't any. Joni Brinkman? Yes. Joel Flores? Yes. Stephen Grant? Jim Koretsky? Yes. Douglas Lawson? Yes. Maria Marino? Yes. Melissa McKinley? Yes. Michael Napoleone? Yes. Corey Nearing? No. Joseph Paduzzi? No. Shelly Petrolia? Yes. Fred Pinto? Yes. Scott Singer? Yes. Andy Thompson? Yes. Pam Triolo? Yes. Hal Valache? Yes. Robert Weinroth? No. 
Greg Weiss. Steve Wilson. Yes. I have 16 to three, it passes, Madam Chair. Um, I have 15 to four. Oh, I'm sorry, let me double check my counting. I have that Commissioner Neary, Commissioner Paduzzi, and Commissioner, we oh, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Weinroth were opposed. Everyone else I have was in support. Okay. Did I miss Thank you anybody so much. that was opposed? I just, for the record, I want to confirm. Okay. No. Nope. Thank you. Okay, the motion passes then 16 to three. All right, that ends our action items. Now we go to our information items. And I know that there was a, a request by one of our TPA board members for a Greyhound Services Overview. So Greg Cohen from uh, Greyhound Lines, Government Affairs Representative, you have the floor. Good morning, can you hear me? I can. Okay, yes. terrific. Well, thank you for inviting me here this morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Greg Cohen. I work in uh, Washington, D.C. for Greyhound Lines Government Affairs. Um, we're having a very interesting go of it. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about what I plan to talk about, which is intermodalism and um, a, a small bit um, uh, discussing uh, how we're responding to COVID-19. Uh, this uh, picture here is uh, the new intermodal in Jacksonville, which we're participating in. A um, little grand in scale, but, uh, but something that we are very happy to see move forward. Uh, you could say upstate. Um, I'll see if I can move the slides. There we go. Okay, so just a little bit of background. I think everyone knows Greyhound is an iconic brand, but uh, you may not know, we uh, celebrate our 100th birthday a few years ago. Um, we have a uh, very good environmental profile, 280 passenger miles per gallon, which is uh, uh, actually better than any other uh, inner city mode, including train. Um, we serve about 2,300 destinations with our partners, in the United States. We also have service in Canada and Mexico. And we have one of the most complicated uh, ticketing systems uh, in, the, in, the, in the world, really, with uh, 245,000 possible ticket combinations, which is, um, if you can imagine, about six to seven times bigger than the largest airline. Uh, we are interlined with 50 regional bus companies around the country. So um, when you leave West Palm and go somewhere, somewhere else in the country, you might be uh, using a, a partner just kind of the same way when you fly on an airline, you might have a leg of that flight that's uh, operated by another uh, carrier. Here in, um, in West Palm and in, in the Palm Beach County area, um, uh, I guess in your jurisdiction, we have a number of stops, a uh, number of uh, major locations, the, the, the most uh, Important one is West Palm. Um, we also, of course, serve Boynton Beach, Delray Beach, Boca Raton, uh, Belle Glade is all the way out to the west, and that's a continuing service that keeps going out to uh, Cape Coral and, and um, other lines that run in central and, and, and the western part of Florida. Um, buses that serve your area continue on to uh, in all directions, the Fort Myers, Orlando, Miami, Tampa, all the way up to New York. And, you know, if you, obviously, as I pointed out, you, you can also transfer off of those routes onto routes to, you know, 2,300 other places. Um, what I really wanted to focus on was the uh, planning provisions that are included in the FAST Act. These are, um, codified into Title 23 and Title 49. So they're permanent law, um, but they were added into the, pa into the FAST Act. Um, mainly, um, the goal is to make sure that um, both 
metropolitan and statewide plans uh, include intermodal facilities that support inner city buses. That requires the identification of inner city buses in planning. Um, I'm sorry, inner city bus facilities and routes and planning, and some consideration of, of the role the buses may play in reducing congestion and pollution and energy consumption and just connecting to other modes. Um, <clears throat> the, the planning provisions also require that a metropolitan planning organization consider strategies and investments that pr preserve and enhance uh, inner city bus systems including those that are privately owned and operated, which is a little bit unusual in uh, planning code because uh, uh, really uh, the inner city bus network is sort of the last remaining nationwide private transit operation of, of most local transit has, almost all local transit has become public uh, since the 1960s, but uh, Greyhound and, and its partners sort of continue on. Uh, so including uh, um, inner city bus, including private operated inner city bus and plans is sort of an unusual uh, um, provision in federal law. Um, it also requires that um, there be sort of a good faith effort to reach out and include inner city bus operators among stakeholders uh, that participate or comment on planning, planning documents. Um, and of course, in many cases, uh, you know, they're, 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 I would say the vast majority of planning documents, uh, bus operators uh, would have, you know, probably just tangential interest, but if it involves something like um, on the highway side, uh, toll lanes or, uh, or special access for buses that are public, we would probably want to be able to comment and, and request that we be included, or on the transit side, uh, any sort of uh, transit uh, development um, where there's a potential that we might be able to make connections, that would be something we'd be interested in. And also inclusion of inner city bus as a strategy for congestion management. So our priorities are basically just to develop working relationships with planners. And so uh, really appreciate the opportunity to do so now with you all. Um, to include inner city bus as a concept in, in various scenario planning options, to partner on intermodal center developments. And, you know, when we get involved in these intermodal centers, uh, we pay rent. We don't ask for free access. So sometimes our participation can help reduce the operating costs by, you know, paying a sort of a fair share of our involvement. So that could also help reduce some costs. Um, one of the big things we're doing now is, and, and we're, we're working on this both with states and we're looking at this nationally with Amtrak, but um, the availability to do, um, use to new technology to do seamless ticketing, sort of one-stop uh, ticketing on your cell phone or at a ticket uh, counter where you can buy a single ticket that connects you through local transit, Amtrak, Greyhound, uh, to get to virtually anywhere. So um, we've been doing more and more partnerships, and I think within a few years, um, you'll be able to buy a single ticket with a single form of payment, and uh, it'll work for all of these facilities together, and you'll be able to make good connections. Um, I mentioned the HOV or our toll lanes. Um, one of the things that's very important to Greyhound is not getting stuck in traffic. So when there's HOV or, or hot lanes or toll lanes or congestion pricing zones, um, we basically ask to be treated the same as uh, public transit because we are carrying up to 50 people on a bus and it helps to reduce single occupancy car use. Uh, safety, security, and cleanliness is a huge, huge uh, priority for Greyhound. Um, we are we are very proud of our safety record. Um, uh, we're also always worried about other bus companies' safety records because, as you can imagine, when any kind of motor coach has an accident and people are hurt or, or killed, uh, it reflects badly on anyone, anyone in the business. And Greyhound is probably the, the toughest in terms of safety. We were the first bus company that was inter interstate to 
um, support mandatory seatbelts, for example, on the buses. So um, that's a, a huge thing. Security is very important. Uh, a lot of our um, passengers are um, uh, poor to, to put, you know, uh, it's the most affordable form of transportation. So uh, um, sometimes we have security issues and making sure that we don't um, have that or that we have a good plan of action when there's any kind of security problems is important. We also um, do sometimes request uh, homeland security type funds for things like uh, anti-terrorism, especially after the worldwide incidents of, of bus rammings and things like that. So we have some security protocols that we work on. Cleanliness is uh, also a very high priority, particularly in terms of COVID-19, and I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing. So our challenges right now, um, normally uh, we make a profit. We are a private company. These days there isn't a single bus line in the country, not us, not any of our competitors that's actually making a profit. We're losing a lot of money every day. Um, but we're still managing to operate about 37% of our normal frequencies. We've avoided abandoning any routes, but we have reduced the number of buses. So that's how you get to that 37%. In Florida, we're only down about um, 40%. So we're operating about 60% of our normal miles in Florida. Uh, we're generally running about 20% of our normal revenue, uh, 20 to 20 to 25%. So um, pretty easy to see why we're losing a lot of money. Our uh, Northeast hub is sort of the worst case situation, which is um, generally our, our, our New York City type operations and down up there we're, we're down about 90%. So all of our employees and customers have to now be screened before they can get on the, the bus. In some cases, there's up to three screening points. Uh, we don't check the temperature, but we do check for symptoms and we do question our passengers before they get on. They have to, everyone has to now wear a face covering and we don't fill the bus anymore. So we have some um, social distancing requirements, which means less capacity, which also means uh, less profitability. Uh, we are providing um, free tickets for frontline healthcare workers, first responders, uh, even police and fire and, and and mortuary workers, particularly uh, because Greyhound serves a lot of rural areas that don't have um, um, any other real way for folks to get there other than a car. So um, as COVID has spread to some more rural uh, parts of the country, we've been providing free tickets for folks in urban areas that are uh, a part of the response to get there. Um, we're also carrying um, a lot of truck drivers that need to reposition so they might carry a one-way load and have to relocate um, to get back to another truck somewhere else. In the West, particularly California, we're carrying a lot of agricultural workers to keep the food supply going. Um, and then a lot of people don't realize that Greyhound is also a package delivery company. Um, so us, uh, Greyhound and its partners are carrying uh, blood supplies for, the, uh, for various Red Cross blood banks, um, medical equipment and PPE and and, and also lately, as, as schools have announced that they're not going to reopen, we've been shipping a lot of um, dormitory belongings for students back to their homes. Um, here's some, just some other things to, op to, to think about. Um, opportunities for cooperation, um, particularly in Florida. I think you know, we've participated in the past, but it would be great to have a more formal pro process for emergency evacuation planning and readiness. We, uh, I think we probably did a, uh, we'd ha we had a lot of buses running in Katrina in Louisiana. Um, we have had, um, I think, less of Greyhound buses running in Florida during various hurricanes, but we have a lot of relationships with local partners. So we can work with our partners also to help with uh, evacuation planning and of course, we can put our resources uh, towards that as well. Of course, Florida has an enormous number of charter and tour bus operators that um, we can coordinate with. Uh, another thing is just um, being part of mobility solutions for low-income people, students, um, seniors, 
disabled other users. Um, um, and the other, the other item is, it's a little bit off base here, but in terms of intermodal planning, we have an architectural team that um, is pretty good. And if we're involved in a project, we volunteer their time towards the project. So that can also help reduce some costs and also help show kind of what types of things we need to be able to be part of a facility. Um, again, more opportunities, ticketing partnerships, as I mentioned, uh, we're doing these all over the country, but more partnerships with local transit systems, tri-rail, Amtrak. Um, it, when you partner, you expand demand for all the systems and you provide feed and flow. So we all win when we partner together. Um, we also have a, a, a rural bus feeder system that um, is somewhat uh, partially subsidized. Um, there's routes that are basically unprofitable but have some rural value. Um, and Greyhound provides the match for those rural bus feeder services, which are some, sometimes Greyhound runs them, but more, more likely than not, they're a nonprofit or a local transit agency that might run that rural feeder. And then uh, also just new customer attracting technologies and comfort, such as um, free movies, um, better understanding through an app of where your bus is, outlets, and, and, and good internet connections. So some additional goals, um, we, you know, we want to see, be part of urban development plans, redevelopment plans. A lot of our standalone Greyhound stations are becoming outdated. So sometimes that's prime property for redevelopment. And as long as we have another place to go, then sometimes that works out as a win-win. Um, of course, we want to see more beautiful and functional intermodal hubs. I think West Palm Beach is, is a great example of one where we can be very proud of where we are. Um, we want to avoid missed opportunities. Uh, I, I put it in as an example in Hollywood, Florida, uh, um, which uh, thankfully is, it's not a big deal, but um, there's a couple tri-rail stations in, down there in Hollywood. And um, the one that Amtrak uses is at uh, 3001 Hollywood Boulevard. The one that we use is at 2900 Sheridan. And the reason they're um, almost two miles apart is because um, the driveway is slightly too um, tight for our vehicle to turn around in. So that means a missed connection between Amtrak and Greyhound and because 1.7 miles is just too far to walk. So that's just kind of an example of a missed opportunity. And then again, partnering to keep buses out of traffic congestion. So if, um, this is just how to invite Greyhound into your planning process. You contact me and I'll contact, I'll connect you to the local uh, vice president for Greyhound. If they're interested, then, uh, then they will um, participate. If you're working on something that they're not interested in, um, then you've done your due diligence through the planning process to at least reach out. And, uh, you know, obviously we won't be able to participate in every planning process, but, um, but we always appreciate being invited. So that's basically what I have and happy to take any questions. Oh, um, Chair, I'm going to unmute you. There we go. Okay, Margie, do we have any public comment questions? I don't have any public comment cards, but I do have that uh, Vice Mayor Weinrock had a comment on this. Perfect, okay. Bob, you wanna go ahead? Okay, I, I'm, I'm going to comment at the end of the meeting. It wasn't on this particular item. Thank you. All right. Um, I actually, uh, I do have a question, Greg. Do you have examples of other cities where you have maybe taken over their local bus operation? Is that too broad of a question? We don't. <clears throat> no, we, we haven't taken over local operations. We have provided match uh, for federal funds. So if you have a system that qualifies for a program called 5311F, which is rural feeder service. It requires a 20% local match uh, for federal funds. And Greyhound's unsubsidized routes can count um, if there's a connection. Uh, uh, it has to have a meaningful connection to qualify under federal law. But if there's a meaningful connection, then um, Greyhound's costs can be used towards the match, which, require, which means no local cost. Um, 
So we don't take it over, but we do coordinate scheduling so that, um, so that people who are using those local systems to connect into Greyhound can have an efficient connection and don't spend you know, hours waiting for their connection or um, you know, are basically too far between the two uh, systems to, to walk uh, between, the, between the connections, especially if they have bags. And have you worked with our local palm train agency to see what we can do as partners? No, um, I was uh, hoping that this conversation might help to get that started. Okay, good. Well, thank you for being here and thank you for your presentation. Do I have any other questions or comments from the board? Well, thank you, Greg, again, oh, yeah, thank I'm you sorry. very much. Oh. Thank you. Uh, great. Jody, I don't have a hand either. <laughs> Jody, do you have phone. a question? Um, I, just want, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on that statement um, about the rural matching funds to see if maybe there's an opportunity to see if we could use some of those funds for the connection to, uh, connection to Belle Glade to the, tr to the station downtown? That would be a great idea. We'd be happy to work with you. Thank you, Greg. I'm sure that staff here at following your presentation are gonna, gonna come up with a bunch of questions for you and for Palm Tran to see if there's something we can do in, in a partnership. Great, thanks very Thank much. You. Margie, do you see anybody else's hand raised or any? I don't see people waving, so. No, I, mean, not sure. I don't see any. All righty, I will now invite uh, Steve Abrams, SFRTA Executive Director, to present. Hello there, Madam Chairman. Uh, Hello. Great How are you, Steve? Fine, thanks. It's great to see everyone, even if it is through a computer screen. Uh, I've been trying to keep up uh, with TPA. I, I watched the last meeting, for example, and was uh, texting with uh, some of the members to try to provide some meaningful input. I told uh, Vice Mayor Weinroth to sit up straight, quit looking at his phone, you know, things like that. Um, but uh, I still get to work, uh, of course, with Nick and the staff, so that's been nice. And of course, uh, Commissioner Valache is the uh, vice chairman of SFRTA. So I still, of course, he's now my boss. So uh, you don't have to be nice to him. Uh, anyway, to, if I can work these slides or Margie can you release me to work my slides here. Um, you should have been given access. You may have to click on the screen to advance it. Click, up, click on the screen. Can I click it? Oh, there we go. Okay. So, whoop. All right. So let me go back one. All right. So there we go. So this I call my uh, ah the good old days slide. Uh, you know we're still 72 miles, 18 stations, connect to all three major airports. Although we're not doing too much business uh, at the airports these days, uh, we ended. Uh, 2019 with record ridership, uh, about four and a half million riders, the highest in the 30 year history of Tri-Rail. Uh, we were looking forward uh, this year to welcoming our uh, 100 millionth rider on the system, which is uh, 100 million trips off of the road. And then of course, uh, the coronavirus hit us all. Our ridership uh, dropped about 80%. We reduced service from 50 to 18 trains a day on the, on the weekdays, 12 on the weekends, suspended fares. We certainly were not uh, uh, providing the same level of service, uh, and, but still kept operating and, and really took and do take our responsibility very seriously to uh, transport essential workers to healthier healthcare and other jobs. We also maintain the tracks uh, for the South Florida Rail Corridor, so uh, are uh, part of the effort to keep the freight supply moving, but safely. So on our trains, as you can see, we taped off seats to assist uh, social distancing. We roped off cars uh, to protect the conductors. We added a coach to all of our trains so people could spread out. And uh, mentioned we eliminated fares. Uh, that also eliminated the contact between our uh, 
officers who collected tickets and, and our passengers, and also they didn't have to use the, um, uh, the TVMs to purchase their tickets, the ticket vending machines. And we, of course, uh, redoubled our efforts and continued to sanitize our trains thoroughly. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to play that role coming out of this uh, COVID-19 crisis. Our goal is to uh, safely match the demand as people gradually return to uh, work and to school, uh, playing a critical role in uh, coming out of the recession that we're in by uh, continuing to open up uh, regional job opportunities for folks. We're going to do our best to accelerate our maintenance and capital projects to boost the economy. Uh, but unfortunately, one thing that did not go away in all of this is uh, our, our financial challenges. One thing I miss, not too much that I miss, about being um, in uh, uh, an elected official in the county or the, or the municipalities is that I had zoning authority, I had taxing authority. We do not. We're funded uh, through uh, revenues that we received uh, mainly uh, for our operations from uh, FDOT and the three counties uh, that is in, was embedded in a statute that was adopted by the legislature in 2010. So those numbers have not changed. Uh, so you can imagine when I came through the door uh, a little over a year ago now, uh, facing a huge deficit, $16 million deficit and growing. And I'm pleased to report that, uh, you know, Commissioner Valachie is going to hear this for the first time, that uh, in, on Friday, I'm going to submit to the board a budget that shows a zero deficit. So we really worked hard to tighten our belt, to use um, whatever other revenue sources uh, we have uh, to be able to uh, right our ship. We reduced our staff some 25%, but that still does not provide us with long-term sustainability. If anything, it gets us through the next uh, few years. So of course, I went back to my friends at the at Palm Beach County and of course the other two counties at, as well as FDOT to see what we could do about increasing their contribution from 10 years ago. Uh, that of course uh, now has uh, confronted uh, the coronavirus in the sense that uh, of course this has blown a hole in all, everyone's budget including of course the counties. Uh, but so. I, you know, I can't ask for the amount that I was previously requesting, but you know, we're still get, continuing our dialogue and we'll see where that ends up. Uh, but clearly um, in the future, we're gonna need to uh, have additional contribution from the, the counties and the state to keep operating in, in the long term. In the meantime though, uh, on the capital side, the, the uh, TPA has uh, provided SFRTA with funding above and beyond uh, what we receive for capital assistance, which has been uh, very helpful. We do that through our uh, transit asset management plan, which is required by the uh, Federal Transit Administration, uh, where we identify in each of the um, uh, each of the categories, uh, capital categories that you see here uh, on the uh, left side of the screen, rolling stock, uh, infrastructure, mainly our track uh, facilities, uh, whether it be our stations, our maintenance facilities, uh, and also other equipment that we use. And so we put in a request uh, to uh, the TPA. Uh, we're going to be requesting uh, help with our rolling stock. We use that. We're able to use that as a match, especially with uh, the other MPOs also uh, going. Uh, providing assistance in that respect, and uh, we'll be able to uh, rehabilitate or add additional rolling stock, so we appreciate that. What does the future hold? Hey, nobody knows what the future holds. I told someone the other day, if, if someone comes up to you and tells you what they, that they know, that they claim to know the, the future of this pandemic, you need to stand more than six feet away from them. Uh, the fact that, but we still have our vision for the future, that, uh, including uh, the downtown Miami link, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, that one seat ride uh, from uh, Palm Beach County and Broward County into 
downtown Miami. The agreements have been in place for some time. Uh, we have completed the connection onto the FEC corridor. Uh, we have our, our platform in the downtown Miami uh, Brightline station is completed. What's holding that up, unfortunately, is a delay on the part of Brightline in implementing their positive train control. Positive train control is a uh, mandate of the federal government on all railroads in the United States. It's a very uh, costly and complicated GPS-based crash avoidance system uh, that must be implemented on the FEC tracks before Tri-Rail can advance on their tracks. We, of course, are subject to the same mandate on our existing corridor. We do intend to uh, complete uh, installing and implementing our, our PTC by the uh, December 31st uh, deadline, federal deadline that is not, uh, cannot be moved because that's also, that's in a federal statute. Uh, and at, at the time, at such time as Brightline completes their uh, PTC implementation, then we are invited, they as the host railroad invite us on as a tenant we have to take a couple of months to ensure that our PTC system is uh, compatible, can operate with theirs, and then we can uh, go into service in downtown Miami. Similarly, uh, along that downtown Miami link, there's been some uh, interest on the part of Miami-Dade County in renewing a, a station at Wynwood. I'm sure well, most of you are familiar with Wynwood, kind of the hot spot of South Florida. Uh, even probably now, probably a lot of folks are down there uh, wandering around without masks on, uh, keeping their social distance. But you know, a great, uh, a great uh, social hot spot in South Florida, and we're hoping we're starting the planning for a station in the, that Midtown Wynwood area in conjunction with uh, Miami-Dade County, City of Miami, FDOT, other partners down there. Uh, of interest to Palm Beach County is uh, completion of our northern layover facility. That's one of those uh, projects that uh, we're trying to accelerate. And I know it's of great interest, uh, especially to uh, the West Palm Beach members of the TPA because that current layover facility is located uh, right next to our the West Palm Beach station, which you know, back in the 1920s when the Seaboard Railroad was operating was a nice rural area to have a maintenance yard. Uh, but now, of course, is right in the middle, of, uh, is right in their downtown area uh, where condominiums have uh, developed and uh, hotels, offices. So it really does need to be moved to a more appropriate industrial area, which we have identified further north. Uh, we're working diligently. We just completed agreements. It actually is on the border of three cities, uh, West Palm, uh, Riviera Beach, and uh, Mangonia Park. So completed interlocal agreements with the three uh, municipalities and are now working on the documents uh, that should be completed shortly to put an RFP out uh, to actually uh, build the, uh, the new layover facility. That also helps us in our effort to extend service to Jupiter, uh, another uh, initiative that I've been working on for years of great interest to the county. Unfortunately, again, that occurs on the FEC tracks. When you get to Mangonia Park, our, our tracks veer off to Orlando. So in order to continue to go further north, to stop at St. Mary's, Riviera, Palm Beach Gardens, Jupiter, you have to cross over uh, to the FEC tracks. And you then need their permission to use their tracks. And the permission does not come cheap. There's a huge access fee that would be associated with that. Uh, on the other hand, again, we've done everything we can do to be in a position to provide that service. We have constructed the crossover uh, that would take trains uh, from our existing corridor over to FEC. You can go and see it at Northwood. So, you know, we're, we're uh, in a position to uh, provide that service. 
uh, if and when uh, Brightline uh, would uh, come to agreement on uh, allowing access and uh, with the accompanying access fee, I'm sure, to provide that service. So, you know, uh, South Florida's future certainly uh, depends on us. Uh, we can, I think, all be uh, reasonably assured that after this pandemic ends, South Florida will still experience overdevelopment, traffic congestion, uh, as uh, much as we endeavor uh, to bring high-tech and biotech industries to our county and to South Florida, which you know we're, we're successful in doing, we're still gonna be uh, very much a service economy, uh, a construction economy, hopefully once again, a booming tourist economy. And so these are jobs uh, you can't telework and do. I, uh, you have to be on site. Uh, these are jobs that where everyday workers need to get to their workplace. Uh, Tri-rail continues to be uh, the only mode that can carry uh, between 300 and 500 people in one trip, uh, doesn't use the roads. Uh, and so uh, 400 cars equals eight buses equals one train, which is our train. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm glad to answer any questions anyone has. All righty. Thank you very much. Who has questions for Steve? I have. Because uh, I can't tell. So, Marge, you got anybody who? Yes, Commissioner Balache. Yeah, I'll thank right you. Ahead. So, um, Steve, Sunrail is about to come off its subsidy program, I think, and I would imagine they're in a similar situation from us, uh, although you've done a remarkable job of getting that deficit. You didn't say what it started at. I think this year is 14 and a half million, right? And you got it down to zero. But what are they going to look at in terms of uh, funding their operating costs. And I, I was thinking that if they get into some uh, pressured situation, it's going to help us find, you know, at the state level, of the elusive, you know, ongoing source of funding. Yeah, SunRail operates similarly to TriRail, but under a different statute. And their statute, in fact, requires them to come up with uh, a sole funding source, sole dedicated funding source uh, in, uh, I think, uh, a year or two. So they've been seriously looking, really they have no real choice but to go to the voters to ask for that source or probably to, if they, if, especially with economic conditions the way they are, to go back to the legislature and get some sort of an extension on that, on this, on that requirement, have their statute amended. Uh, but certainly that does uh, put the focus on uh, the uh, local governments uh, coming up with the funding in order to uh, continue uh, much needed commuter rail service. We'll, we're watching that very closely, but we're fortunate that we're under a different statute. Our funding is embedded in that statute, albeit does, it does not have any cost of living adjustment or, or anything like that. So. Uh, we have to um, come up with additional funding sources in order to, to continue on, but we don't have that sort of drop dead deadline that Sunrail has. Okay, thanks. Margie, anybody else? I don't see anybody else, um, no, and I don't see that we have any public comments as well. Thank you. Steve, thank you always for the update. We appreciate it. You're welcome back anytime. My pleasure. Uh, I try not to make too many motions. If I watch the meeting now to the conclusion, I'll try not to make any motions. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> All righty, next up I'd like to, let's see, talk item C, which is the draft fiscal year 21-25 transportation improvement program and Jason Price, TPA TIP coordinator is going to present. Hi, Jason. Hi. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. So tonight, today I'm going to present to you a draft 
of the final transportation improvement program that will come to you in June for uh, a vote for a final approval. <clears throat> Today is uh, simply a draft to go over. And the transportation improvement program covers a five year time horizon and includes projects from FDOT, local, and our regional planning partners. So to begin with the timeline, <clears throat> back in July 2019, um, the TPA formulated our priority list. <clears throat> uh, we send that to the FDOT to evaluate funds and costs, and they incorporate our request into their draft tentative work program, which is then uh, provided to us to develop our draft tip, which is before you today. And we'll finalize that with any other changes and bring that for final adoption in June <clears throat> next month. And then we'll begin to operate under the, the new tip once it is approved next month. So just to go over a, how this, the TIP is structured. It's structured into sections, and the primary section that I'll focus on in the presentation is the TPA priority projects, and there's three, cat, three sections within the TIP that are covered, and that's the major TPA projects and our two grant programs, local initiatives and transportation alternatives. There's also other sections that are included um, <clears throat> that you can see by the other two uh, boxes here the FDOT local and modal projects, which are the CIS capacity projects, which are our main line um, throughout the county, and then the other FDOT projects, local projects, and other regional uh, transportation modes, along with uh, operation and maintenance of all the facilities that are built and maintained, including transit. So this is just a quick overview of the summary tables that you'll find in the executive summary, as well as the draft tip and the final tip uh, document. <clears throat> this is a good kind of snapshot and overview of all of the projects within those sections. And this is just a, a preview of, you know, what's in the summary table and how to read it from left to right in terms of, you know, what, what it's contained, what can, what's contained in the summary table. Here's all of the, the, here's the tip basically broken down by total funding. And you can see we, uh, we added a little more information here so you could see the number of projects within each of the sections. And you can see that CIS capacity, there's only 38 projects, but it's a considerable amount of funding. And that's due to, uh, you know, those are the big ticket items that include uh, the Florida Turnpike uh, right away and construction costs. Um, large I-95 intersection projects in the B-Line Highway from North Lake Boulevard to Blue Heron Boulevard. I'm going to go over the three major sections in the TIP. Um, the first is the major TPA projects, and that has a five-year target of about 114 million in federal and state funds. And currently in the TIP, there is 156 million programmed. Um, and that's due to some of the highlights you see on this slide, which is the State Route 7, uh, the two projects that are funded for construction in fiscal year 22. Um, those two projects alone uh, add a considerable amount to uh, what's in the TIP. And then there's also for major TPA projects. As, and then there's also a couple of other projects at the bottom here, the Tri-Rail extension to Jupiter. The PD&E was, was delayed from 21 to 22, as well as the Atlantic Avenue project from State Route 7 to Lions Road. The construction was delayed a year as well. For our two grant programs, the first one, the local initiatives, <laughs> This has a five-year target of about 100 million in federal and state funds, and it is being programmed at that level. And it has been producing quite a few projects that are now coming online to be constructed. As you can see in the highlights, eight projects were schedule, are scheduled for construction in fiscal year 21. So if you applied for a grant and you went through the process, these are kind of the, the fruits of going through the grant 
and you know going through the process you know it's a five to seven year lead time and and now we're starting to see a lot of those projects come online and become uh, be constructed in fiscal year 21 and also from last year's grant uh, program all six new project projects were funded in construction for fiscal year 24 and 25 so um, the grant program is working very well and we're getting good projects and they're being programmed and moving through the tip and being constructed. The same is true for the Transportation Alternatives Program. This has a three-year target of $9 million of federal and state funds and six projects are scheduled for construction in fiscal year 22, as well as all four projects were funded in construction for fiscal year 23 from last year's grant cycle. And there's a few other highlights um, there's a few more projects, the Belvedere Heights Neighborhood Sidewalk and Lighting and the FNL Pathway Lighting um, are both coming now up for construction soon. Wanted to highlight just a few more projects we can look forward to in fiscal year 21 for construction highlights. And that's, there's, I won't read through them, but you can see them on the slide here. There's roadway resurfacing, um, there's roadway capacity projects, some, some widening of a few different segments, and then there's also some bridge projects, Jupiter Inlet Bridge Replacement, as well as the uh, Palm Beach Lakes Boulevard Bridge Rehab over FEC uh, Railroad. There's also several intersection improvement projects listed in the tip as well. So that concludes my presentation for the tip. Now again, this is a draft version, and you'll see the final version in June for adoption. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Jason. Do we have any public comment cards on this? Marty, you're muted. <laughs> I am, I'm sorry, it wouldn't unmute for me. No public comments, but I do have that Commissioner Paduzzi has his hand in. Joe, go right ahead. Thank you, make sure my microphone's unmuted here. Uh, I just had a quick question um, on Table one, the major highway transit and freight projects, 06-1, 06-2. Uh, those are the two State Road 7 projects. Am I reading it correctly? Is there an increase, a cost increase um, for those two projects, or am I not reading that correctly? Well, Andrew, do you have the tip pulled up at all? Uh, can you give me the at the end? Uh, Mr. Paduzzi? I'm sorry? Could you give me those, uh, what were the? It's the zero six seven projects, right? and, Yeah, 06-1 okay. and 06-2, the two State Road 7 widening and um, extension projects. All right. Madam Chair, I can speak to that while Jason's looking up the background. The, the cost estimates in the five-year TIP are consistent with the long-range plan amendment that was adopted by the TPA governing board in February, and they are consistent with the cost estimates that were utilized for the project in uh, prior fiscal years as well. Okay, thank you. Joe, does that answer your question? Okay, I, I just was, I guess I was confused when I was talking to city staff about that next column next to the total costs. Um, there's one that has 61, 682, and then 8,082, and then 24, 564, and 4,116. So those are increases over that 73 plus million uh, that was originally approved February 20th. No, I, I don't believe there are increases. I think the total cost as presented in the TIP is uh, the 61 plus the 24. So that is uh, the $85 million. But what happened in our long range plan is we were not obligated to show the funding that had been expended prior to fiscal year 21 because the long range plan addresses the current fiscal year and the next 24 fiscal years after that. So we, what we're showing in the, in the prior to fiscal year 21 column adjacent to that is the $12 million that has already been expended in doing the project development environmental phases of those projects, 
the design, the right-of-way purchase, and any uh, already expended mitigation activities. What is shown in the, in the following five years is the portion that is consistent with the long-range plan um, mm -hmm. amendment amount. So it's, I think that the point is that you're not comparing an apple and an apple when you're comparing the total cost shown on this table to the amounts in the long-range plan because the long-range plan as adopted only needs to include the future expenses that are expected to be incurred for that project, not the prior year expenses. If I may just follow up briefly. Sure. Uh, so I just, I guess I was under the, the impression the whole time that this was a 63 plus million dollar project when really we're now at 86 plus million. Um, at what point does that 20% figure trigger um, a requirement of a revote on the project? Uh, Madam Chair, if I could respond again. Please. The, the request in June is going to be for the TPA mm -hmm. board to adopt the five-year TIP with the funding amounts shown for this project, which is approximately you know, $53 million over the next five years for the portion of State Road 7 from 60th to North Lake, and then $20 million for the portion of State Road 7 from Okeechobee to 60th. If after adoption, the DOT is to go forward and identifies cost increases for these projects that are more than 20% above those totals, and they have not yet come back to us with a full update of the five-year TIP, which gives them an opportunity to readjust total project costs for all of the projects in the program. If they need to make an increase in the interim period, at that point, they would present to us the, re the rationale behind the increase, what was true about their estimate and what their construction contract bids actually came in at and request a TPA board authorization to spend additional funds to construct those projects. Good. Okay, and, and, and just brief follow-up, just so that I understand um, how it's gonna work going forward. Um, if there are incremental increases, do those incremental increases that occur over time, are they all taken as uh, a, um, an increase to the whole for purposes of determining whether it's a 20% increase from that initial 73 million? You know, how does that, how does that work? Can you, can you sure. say, okay, we're gonna increase it 10 million this year, next year it's another 20 million, but they, each individual one, the increments fall under 20%, so therefore it doesn't require a revote, or are they taken all together, um, you know, the sum of, of those incremental increases? Madam Chair, it's, a, it's an excellent procedural question. Um, yep. Here's the way the system works. The, the DOT develops a work program in cooperation with the TPA staff that implements or constructs the TPA's priority project list. Each year, they predict what they believe the construction costs and all other phases, the costs of all other phases of those projects will be. When the TPA board adopts that, that gives the the department the ability to go forth and expend up to those amounts plus an additional 20 percent for every one of the 483 projects in the program without coming back to the TPA board for an amendment. If any one of those projects exceeds that 20 percent and the increase is more than two million dollars so that means that for smaller projects, they might have a more than 20% increase, but a less than $2 million increase. They are allowed to make those changes without coming back to the TPA governing board. That's that, but this, the, the criteria only applies for the period in between annual adoption votes by the TPA governing board. Next year, when the, when the department develops its TIP and asks us to uh, present it to you for adoption, they have the ability to update all of the cost estimates for every one of the projects in the TIP. And that vote alleviates their obligation to present one-time requests for individual projects because they're essentially saying, these are our newly updated costs. 
if we have significant changes, but we ask you to adopt the entirety of the program, we treat that action by the TPA governing board as an overall endorsement of all of the changes. Now, we recognize that sometimes that gives the ability of an agency constructing projects to hide changes like that that may be more significant in that annual adoption. And so what we've done is in the presentation to you for the draft and for, especially at the draft work program, we've actually identified any projects that have a significant change in funding amount that are on your priority list. So we would say in the fall when the DOT is updating their work program, if they are in their update proposing to change the cost amounts for any of your priority projects, we would highlight that information for you and say to you, TPA board members, are you sure that you want to endorse this significant changes that are being presented to you in the updated work program? So we try to capture that information and make sure that you recognize that what you're being presented with constitutes a departure from what you adopted last year. But we do understand that the way we do business is to adopt the entirety of the program each year, which gives the department an opportunity to sort of reshuffle the deck. And, and I'll, I'll make one more editorial comment in response. That's not unlike what would happen at the county engineering department when they're presenting an update to their five-year road program or what would happen to any of the cities when they're presenting an annual update to their capital improvement program. All of us as implementing agencies recognize that our estimated quantities for construction projects as well as the unit prices that we anticipate to receive in any bids for those projects are going to fluctuate with economic conditions. And so we, we have to have the ability to update both cost estimates and available revenues on an annual basis in order to uh, present to you a cost feasible and implementable construction plan. Thank you. Joe, Don? Thank, for now, thank you. Okay, anyone else have questions? Madam Chair, I did have a public comment um, and Commissioner McKinley does have her hand raised as well. Okay, why don't you read us the public comment and then Melissa, you, it, you're it welcome to speak. It is an attendee that's um, on the call, so I'm just gonna allow them to talk and unmute them. Uh, Betty, okay. are you? Hi there, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I have a question regarding uh, whether or not the TPA has any resources available for the smaller communities, uh, municipalities, uh, special improvement districts, such as Indian Trail Improvement District, where we're not LAP certified, and therefore we cannot qualify for some of those grant dollars um, uh, that are available. And um, I, I think that uh, by virtue of that LAP certification requirement, um, if the FDOT is not able to uh, manage the project um, and it's not a, a project that the county has a right of way in, um, then essentially those uh, communities are being left out. And it, does the TPA have the ability to um, assist in that regard? Nick, you want to handle that or Jason? Sure, I, I'll take that. Um, I, th I think there's two parts to it. So when the TPA, one of our primary roles is to allocate federal funds to projects at a local level. The DOT says in order to receive federal dollars, you have to be LAP certified, which means you have to have proven that you have the, some, the financial sophistications and the engineering acumen, the, the skills and abilities to conduct a federal aid project. Uh, some local agencies don't have the ability to be certified to do those projects. So the primary options that we have proposed for those local agencies in order to be able to get projects funded is talk to the DOT staff early in the development of your project list and ask them if they are willing to construct projects off the state system on your behalf. This round, the DOT said, our workload is such that we cannot do that for any of your local governments. But in previous cycles, the DOT has accepted that offer and constructing and is constructing several projects on behalf of our local governments. So we need to continue to push on the DOT and say, would you be willing to help us? You can also look at adjacent local governments that have the ability and authority to construct projects on your behalf. In this case, it would be Palm Beach County Engineering. Palm Beach County Engineering could help the Indian Trail Improvement District as a constructing agency for projects that are not on county roads. 
Now, county engineering has, a, has established an internal, an internal policy statement that says we don't want to construct projects that are off of county roadways. It's not in our best interest to do so, but there, that conversation could continue and the TPA board could certainly encourage county engineering to be more of a willing partner to local governments who are seeking funding and construction support for projects like that. And then I'm gonna throw one more idea out there as a precursor to a conversation that maybe we could have at our strategic plan committee. Other states in the country have convinced their state DOTs to take the MPO's federal dollars for state projects, big, big projects like I-95 widenings or interchange modifications or things like that. And in exchange, give the MPO's state money in exchange for the federal funds that the MPO provides to the state DOT. They do a fund swap, and then the requirements for those state dollars that can be provided to local governments are less onerous than the federal requirements. Now, I'm gonna say this is a strategic plan conversation because there's a state law that says Florida cannot do that. So we would have to advocate for a change to that kind of a state law if we wanted to propose a fund swap on a statewide level that would give local governments a little more access and flexibility to the funding that we currently have available. Wow. Thank, thank you, Nick. I, I just want to state for the record that um, Indian Trail uh, lost a significant uh, grant that we were counting on last year. And as you know, these grants are five years out. Um, so we're, um, you know, trying to plan uh, projects five years out. Uh, and each year that we miss out, we're missing out on those opportunities. As you know, our community has great needs uh, with respect to uh, impacts from surrounding developments, and uh, we're trying to address those needs um, on many different levels. Uh, but we lost out on an opportunity last year because FDOT uh, was not able to um, do the, the certification for us and uh, because the county had adopted this new policy. Um, and uh, we have been informed that FDOT DOT will not be um, uh, able to uh, do it again this year. So we're now going to lose out on yet another opportunity. Um, this is a, a time when uh, our community has the greatest need and we're being left out from getting the share of dollars uh, to our community. And I, I just would really appreciate the TPA having a discussion about that. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, maybe some of the council members are aware of the challenges that smaller communities, smaller municipalities, special districts who, um, uh, you know, those roads, we have a, a significant number of our roads are not county roads, um, but yet are uh, having to deal with the impact of traffic uh, that are um, outside Madam of Chair. our district. Uh, yes. I've been Betty, timing this, is, this um, and it's, um, it's been three minutes from the first portion of the comment to the second portion. Correct. Correct. Thank, Betty, you. thank you for your comments. If, if you want to do this offline with Nick and then um, okay. talk to us again, that would be great. Thank you. And I believe we have, do we have more McKinley. comments or questions? Uh, Commissioner McKinley has her hand raised. Thank you. Melissa, go ahead. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, on that last uh, conversation, um, there are major concerns with the county assuming liability uh, for a lot of these requests, and hence the reason county engineering has wanted to push off. And surely there's got to be a creative way for some of these smaller communities and organizations to be able to work together on their own lap certification and maybe something uh, the TPA staff can explore with them. But my comment was uh, regarding the actual plan before us right now. Um, and I just really want to thank staff, um, you know, for putting so many of our rural community projects on here. We have a, quite a funding issue trying to get some of these road improvements done out in the Glades area. It's important more now than ever to be able to move our agricultural products um, you know, get them from the field to the market. And when I look on this and I see the improvements on US 27, on State Road 700 at Hatton Highway, at State Road 715, at, you know, um, State Road 80 to US 27, State Market Road, Connors Highway, just a lot of really good projects 
that will benefit our farm to market community. And I just, I don't often thank Nick a whole lot. <laughs> it's been a little contentious these last few years. Um, but Nick, thank you for paying particular attention to the needs in that part of the county. Thanks. Thank you, Melissa. Are there any other comments on this item? I don't see any other hands raised. Uh, thank you. And we do have, uh, do we have any partner agency updates? Um, oh. Madam Chair, you skipped item 3D. The 2019 performance measures report card. I'm not even seeing it on my agenda. Sorry. Oh, there you go. Okay. Sorry, I, I apologize. 2019 performance measures report card. Andrew, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be brief. Can you all hear me? Yes, thank you. So I'm just going to uh, present the 2019 performance measures report card. So what this is, is our tracking of how we're doing with our performance measures uh, related to our goals and our adopted 2045 long range transportation plan. So those goals follow our vision of a safe, efficient and connected multimodal transportation system. I'm only going to provide a few highlights and a, a, um, some bigger changes uh, that we saw. Um, this does say 2019, but this data uh, you'll see jumps around from the, the most recent data being 2018 or 2019. A lot of these measures, especially the ones that are, are federal performance measures that we've incorporated, uh, the data is released throughout the year at different times. Sometimes it's even a year uh, later uh, than when the year is uh, we're trying to measure. So we will be keeping this updated on our website at all times. So when the new measures, the new data comes in, we'll be updating this, this document uh, to reflect those changes. The first one I want to mention is preservation. And what I wanted to highlight for you all uh, you can see the columns here for the, the actual values from 2016 to 2019, and you can see our long-range targets in those time frames. Uh, under preservation, we look at the condition of the, the pavement on our interstate and national highway facilities, and then also bridges. The one highlight I have for you is the 2018 value for interstate and good condition. It was a very um, steep drop-off in the pavement condition for the interstate. Uh, we spoke with FDOT about the reason behind this drop-off, and they actually went to a new way of measuring pavement condition and using new technology on the uh, how they record pavement condition uh, required by federal requirements. So that's why you see a huge drop-off there. Uh, the 2019 number should be out any time now, so uh, we'll be putting that on the website uh, and can give it an update once those are released. The next goal is uh, safe. So we have adopted Vision Zero here at the TPA. We have preliminary numbers for you for 2019 that you can see are looking promising uh, for fatalities, serious injuries, and those rates. Uh, I just checked the other today actually on the, the Florida Highway uh, website, and I did see that the 2019 number is around 169 right now, but it is looking like it is going to be lower than the 2018 values uh, in the previous year. We did see, uh, this is a local measure that we're capturing for the TPA, but we did see an increase in the number of rail fatalities in 2019 over the previous 2018 and 2017 years, a jump by two uh, more fatalities. The next category uh, goal is efficient system. So this is where we track the reliability of our interstate system uh, and also our not national highway system and then the productivity of our, our transit systems in the region. The ones I wanted to point out for 2018 values is we're staying pretty steady and going up a little bit in our reliability on the interstate system and then the non-interstate national highway system. And then I wanted to point out for productivity for passenger trips per revenue hour, we did see a slight decrease uh, trips per revenue hour for tri-rail tri service. Now this is a 2018 number, the 2019 numbers uh, are not released at the federal level yet. Uh, we should expect an increase uh, in this trips per revenue hour, as you just saw with Mr. Abrams mentioning that they had record numbers in 2019. So we're looking to see a better productivity when that number is released. And then the Palm Tree and Fixed Route Service, the 2018 value did see an increase. And then we'll also see how that uh, impacts the numbers for 2019 uh, when they did their route performance maximization. 
The next goal is connected, and this is where we track the facilities we have out there for non-motorized transportation. So we track the types of bicycle facilities out there and pedestrian facilities. Uh, this is where we're, we're looking at when products are constructed by our local agencies, uh, the county on their system, and then the ones in the state system. And then anyone that are on the federal aid system, we, we will track as uh, putting into our data. And the highlights I wanted to have for you for 2018 is we did see, or 2019, is we did see a, a larger jump in uh, another 11 miles or so of shared use pathways. So that's thanks to a few of our, our local initiatives and transportation alternatives program that uh, our locals submitted for and constructed more shared use pathways. And we are seeing increases also in, in sidewalks predominantly. Not only do we track the total facilities on the federal aid net eligible network, we also track them in their distance between uh, near transit hubs, elementary schools, and traditionally underserved communities. Just one highlight for here is uh, the increase in pedestrian facilities within a quarter mile of a traditionally underserved community went up by around 3% to 70.9. And this is my last goal I wanted to touch on, uh, multimodal facilities. So we track commuter mode split. Those numbers aren't out yet for 2019. Those will be later in the year. Uh, what I wanted to touch on was freight. So the annual tonnage of freight going through the Port of Palm Beach and then the Palm Beach International Airport. We did see a drop off in 2019 for freight uh, at the Port of Palm Beach, but we did see an increase uh, for Palm Beach International Airport. And I believe that's all I have for you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any Questions? I do have that um, Council Member Koretsky has his hand raised. Jim, go right ahead. Yes, I just want to uh, comment about, first of all, I appreciate the transparency on the interstate pavement uh, condition criteria being changed. And um, what I'd, I'd like to have staff get back with me more to understand that before we then deal with the 2019 one, which I would expect would be similarly low. I do think that when you change something, as they described it, the measurement um, approach, valuation approach, that we really would have to revisit the value to be fair. Even though I've always advocated hold a high standard, again, if, unless I misinterpreted this, you know, we set the 60% standard based on it was something we were meeting and we wanted to main, ensure that we continued to meet, uh, but to then to see in 2018 that we were down to 23% and then receive an explanation that it's a different measurement approach. I do think we need to understand that more um, and perhaps revisit the, uh, you know, the target. So just on that. Okay, we got a screen back up. We got comments from the staff. He, you're exactly right. Uh, we'll be working with FDOT to, to learn more about how they're, they're measuring it now um, and be interested to see how they are going to adjust their targets for the state and then we can work with them to see how we want to approach uh, our county targets. Thank you. Jim, is that good? I, well, I just want to add, no, I, I have confidence staff and again, I appreciate the efforts. I think when we present this next, we might um, you know, this is something that the public sees. We, I think we may need to maybe flag it in the, you know, in the documents that the public sees to maybe a separate line item calling out that the measurement method has changed. Just a suggestion that's for staff to consider. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All righty. Do I have any other comments? Uh, Bob, you, Bob, Bob Weinroth, earlier you had it, said you would comment later. Is there anything you wanted to add? I from a wanna, previous item? No, no, I'm gonna uh, make a comment when we get to the point of discussing the next meeting. <laughs> okay then. Uh, do we have any more comments on the report card? If not, then I will move to item E, partner agency updates, and I don't believe we have any of those. Is that correct, Nick? Uh, that's correct, Madam Chair. Okay administrative items. Our next meeting is June 18th. Bob, do you have a question or a comment? I do. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, I would like to make a suggestion, notwithstanding Executive Order 2069 and our ability to do this as we are now remotely, I think by the time of our next meeting in June, I'd like to suggest that we make, st uh, make plans to get together in person. And if there are members who feel that they would like to continue to come in uh, virtually, that we make provisions for that. I think that we can go ahead and reformat re, uh, that space there so we could uh, distance the members of the TPA. But I think that we lose a little something by being remote as we are here. And I think 90 days out from the original executive order, we should be in a position now to uh, start having in-person meetings. Thank you. Actually, I agree. So I. Nick, why don't we, uh, any other members of, the, of I, the board have comments on that? Madam Chair, Commissioner Valachet has his hand raised. Yes, I would support uh, Commissioner Weinroth. I just, in fact, got an email from my staff about a briefing June 22nd. I said, I hope we're doing in-person meetings uh, by then. And, I, you know, we, I think it's easy to get in the habit because it's simple to stay at home and, you know, sit in front of your computer, but I think we do, as, as the Vice Mayor said, need to start meeting in person, everywhere, all, everything. Thank you. And I, and I think it, show, it sends a good signal to the public as well. It does. All right, so I have, um, the administrative items are just that, there's no presentation or anything of that nature. Do I have any other comments from any of the council members? And if not, then I guess I will make a motion to uh, have a motion to adjourn. So moved. See you all June 18th. Thank you. Thank you, Chair.